Chapter One of the Seventh Sleuths Club. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Seventh Sleuths Club by Carol Norton. Chapter One. Enter the SSC. A musical gong resounding through the corridors of the Sunnyside Seminary was the signal for the opening of doors and the trooping out of girls of all ages in twos and threes and groups, some with ribbon braids, a few with long curls, but most of them with saucy bobs. It was a ten-minute recreation between changing classes. Had it been summer, one and all would have flocked out on the wide green lawns to play a game of toss ball for a few merry moments, or to rest on benches under the great old elms or to saunter up and down the flower-bordered paths. But, since it was a wild, blustery day in January, the pupils of Miss de Morris's school for select young ladies contented themselves, some of them with opening the heavy front door and uttering little screams of pretended fear, or of sincere delight when a snow-laden gust brushed past them, leaving those nearest with wind-tossed hair. Six of them, having no curiosity, it would seem, concerning the weather, gathered about the wide fireplace in the library for a few moments of hurried gossip. "'Where's Mary?' Peggy Pierce asked as she glanced towards the open door that led into the music room. She said we were to come here and wait for her. She's made a wild and wonderful discovery. She told me in class. If Miss Preens didn't have eyes in the back of her head, Mary would have told me what was going on but just as she was starting a round whirled that living skeleton and pointed an accusing bony finger at us as she moaned in that deep uncanny voice of hers miss marion lee one demerit for whispering miss peggy pierce one demerit for listening say can you beat that i don't think she's human rosamond wright declared her iris blue eyes round and serious honest true i think she has demonical powers "'That's too much for me,' laughed little Betty Bird. "'Where do you learn such long words, Rose? "'I'm still using monosyllables.' "'Sounds like it,' Bertha Angel commented. "'To return to the subject under discussion, "'where do you suppose that the President of the SSC is?' "'Peggy Pierce glanced at her wristwatch, "'but, as usual, it had stopped running. "'Time, Peg. "'According to my old reliable, "'there's just five minutes more of recess, and...' "'Doris Dreel broke off to exclaim gleefully, here she comes here's mary then to the girl who laughing and tussled appeared in the doorway leading from the corridor rosamond cried what's the big idea mary didn't you call a fireplace meeting for the very minute after the gong rang and now it's time for the next gong and we haven't heard what it is you have to tell us but mary although she tried to look repentant was laughing so hard that still another moment was wasted while she made an effort to compose herself down on a comfortably upholstered chair she sank, thrusting her feet out towards the blaze. She had laughed herself limp. What, pray tell, is the joke? I suppose you are aware of the fact that it is January the 10th and not April the 1st. Peggy could be quite sarcastic at times. Oh, I say, Peg, have a heart. I did mean to be here, but just as I was leaving class, the living skeleton laid a bony hand on my shoulder and told me to remain in my seat through the recess and think of my sins and of course i had to but all i could think of was the peach of a news item which i have to impart and so the very moment she left the room i broke through that mob out in the corridor and here i am then twinkling eyed she looked up at the others who were standing about her in a thousand years not one of you could guess what i found out heavens mary don't start that old gag of yours at trying to keep us in suspense out with it or the gong will Peg's conclusion was not heard, for the gong, evidently hearing its cue, pealed out six malevolent strokes. Tragic fate! The culprit was too mischievous-looking to seem sincerely repentant. Terribly sorry, girls, but I hate to spoil the thrill you'll get when you hear my news by rattling it off in such a short time. Well, then, after school, what say? Betty Bird asked, but that the gold-brown bobbed curls were being shaken. Can't be done, my love. I've got to practice with Professor Longlocks hadn't opened my music book since last week and say if he didn't lay down the law if i won't practice by myself he says then i shall practice in his presence she drew a long face heaven pity me then hurriedly as they joined the throng in the corridors she whispered to rose who was next to her to-morrow will be saturday if i live till then round up the crowd and come over to my house after lunch and be prepared to hear some news mary lee are you whispering again yes m miss liv er uh, I mean, Miss Preens, but it was awful important. Please excuse me this time, and I will try not to again offend. 
Such penitence was in the brown eyes that glanced beseechingly up at the spindingly tall monitoress that for the moment Miss Preens was almost inclined to accept the apology. Herding forty girls to the study hall and being sure that none of them whispered was rather of a task, and, right at that very moment, she was sure that she saw two heads near the front suspiciously close together, and so she pushed through the ranks at least a head and a half taller than any girl in the school. What a wife she'd make for an ogre, Mary turned, laughing eyes towards the girl following her. It happened to be one of the seniors, and a blue ribbon one at that, and so the humorous suggestion was not meant with appreciation. Mary's mental comment was, When I get to be senior, at least I'll be human. Just as they were entering the study hall for a brief moment, Betty Bird was close. I just can't wait till tomorrow, the youngest member of this SSC whispered. Mary put a warning finger on her lips. Betty glanced up and saw the sharp eyes of Miss Preen turning in their direction. Poor Miss Preen, Mary thought as she sank into her seat and drew a French book from her desk, preparing to study. I wouldn't be her, not for a million. End of chapter 1